Buenas tardes. La conferencia va a ser en inglés, tiene en traducción simultánea y podemos a lo mejor hacer una prueba con el sonido ahora mientras yo presento a la profesora de hoy. Se trata de doña Alison Smith, conservadora y jefe de adquisiciones de arte británico hasta 1900 en la Tate Britain en Londres, puesto que ocupa desde el año 2007, aunque está ligada a esta institución desde hace 12 años. Además de su labor en este museo, ha sido profesora en la Open University de Londres, en el Barber Institute de la Universidad de Birmingham y en el Sotheby's Institute. Es una de las máximas especialistas en arte victoriano y en concreto ha trabajado en profundidad a los integrantes de la hermandad pre-Rafaelita, pre habiendo comisariado y participado de los catálogos de importantes muestras sobre estos asuntos, así como sobre artistas de la talla de Turner, Whistler, Monet, Blake o Millet. La ponencia de hoy para este curso se titula eh, John Everett Millet, un toque de España, y tratará la figura de este artista analizando cómo la idea de España tuvo especial relevancia en su obra. Gracias. Señoras y señores, buenas tardes. If you excuse me, I'll be talking in English. Now, my talk tonight is going to be about this artist, John Everett Millet, who was probably the most successful and prolific artist of his generation. He's seen here in the self-portrait commissioned from him by the Uffizi for its gallery of portraits by famous artists in the 19th century. Now, Millet is best known for his association with the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, but after the breakup of this short-lived avant-garde movement, he went on to become the most famous of Victorian painters. He sort of pioneered a new kind of psychological realism in art. He presented characters from the past and present in complex situations that really engage the audience's sympathy. Now, in contrast to the rebellious image of his youth, in his maturity, as you see here, Millet presented himself more as a modern old master. It was his aim to pitch himself against the great painters of the past in order to promote his own kind of psychological realism. Millet's engagement with one of these masters, Velazquez, and the Spanish school is going to be the focus of this talk this evening. Now, one of the first things I should say about Millet is that he was destined for success from a very early age. He was a child prodigy. At the age of 11, in 1840, he was the youngest student ever to enter the prestigious Royal Academy schools in London. And as this young student, as his teenager in the Royal Academy, he made his mark by winning a number of competitions, as you see here. This is a um, picture he produced in 1846. He won a gold medal for it in 1847. It's um, a subject from Spanish, Spanish history, Pizarro seizing the Inca of Peru. This painting um, represents the Inca king Atahualpa um, being seized by the conquistador Francisco Pizarro at the Peruvian high town of Cajamaja in 1532. This was an event which resulted in the slaughter of thousands of um, um, Indians. But in this painting, Millet's not so much interested in showing the climax of a familiar narrative. Um, it's not, not so interested in showing the intricacies of psychological relationships, but rather he wants to show the climatic moment of a familiar narrative. This was based on a book which had just been published by a historian called William Prescott, The History of the Conquest of Peru. And also, Millet had just seen a play in London by Sheridan called Pizarro. So it's very much a theatrical um, production. Now, for a teenager, you might say this is a highly accomplished painting, and indeed it is. But the point I want to make is that it's a very conventional image. 
He's utilising the language of the European Baroque and also British history painting as taught by the Academy. So it's a strong use of chiaroscuro or contrast of dark and light and it's also hierarchically arranged. So you have the um, Inca king at the apex of a triangle being pushed off this beer and Pizarro reaches out to touch him. They are the key players in this drama. Subsidiary ones are shrouded in sort of new, um, darker tones. And to the left, you have the fanatical friar Valverde raising his crucifix against the setting sun, which is, of course, emblematic of the capitulation, the surrender of the Inca kingdom and empire to um, imperial Spain. Now, what's interesting, within just a couple of years of producing this accomplished, but as I said, conventional painting, Millet produces this. It's an extraordinary change in style. And this has a lot to do with his membership of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Millet was a founder member of this radical um, avant-garde um, group, which was formed by seven students at the Royal Academy who were barely out of their teens, and they were reacting against what they felt was a derivative art that had followed in the wake of the high renaissance, epitomised by the Raphaelites, who were Raphael's followers. And instead, they took their inspiration from early Italian and Netherlandish um, painting, as well as from observed reality. And they felt that early pre-Renaissance art was purer, more spiritual and moral, and less obsessed with, st with style or artifice than painting which was produced after Raphael. So you can see in this painting, Isabella, how the language of the Baroque, which we saw in the previous painting, has been, been completely rejected. And this song, Chioscuro, these sort of triangular groupings, this hieratic arrangement, um, the central focus, has given away to this precision, brilliant colour, and a willful, pre-modern use of perspective. Just look at the angle, the orthogonal, of that line of figures around the table. And Miller has done this to explore the relationships in this particular group. Now, the subject of this painting comes from a famous poem by the poet John Keats called Isabella, or the Pot of Basil. This tells the story of Lorenzo and Isabella, who are the couple you can see in the front of the painting. Um, they, are, they have fallen in love, but Lorenzo, who's of a lower social class, he's an employee in the firm of Isabella's um, brothers, and they dislike him. And in the poem, they plot to kill him, which they eventually do, and Isabella is so grief-stricken she cuts off his, the head of the dead body and plants it in a pot of basil. Now, it's a very sinister, macabre story. And in the painting, the grisly outcome is really sort of foretold by the various details of the composition. So, for example, the lovers are sharing a blood orange. That's symbolic. In the distance, there's a rather sinister pot on the ledge. But what really betrays the macabre nature of this painting is the strong element of portraiture or realism in the painting. All the faces of the characters around the table were studied for Millet's friends and relatives. Dante Gabriel Rossetti, one of the founder members of the Brotherhood, he's the figure at the end draining wine from a glass. Walter Deverell, another member of the Brotherhood, he's weighing up a glass, he's about to drink, sort of biting his fingernails on the other um, side. Millet is focusing on all the quirks and peculiarities of character to get across the point that ostensibly these people are sharing their meal. Some are drinking, some are burping, you know, some are wiping their mouths. But underneath, in their minds, they're all plotting or they're pretending not to be aware of what's going on between the lovers. So it's a very different way of approaching 
narrative painting at the time. And indeed, it was considered to be how highly audacious, particularly the figure at the front, the very cruel brother who's shown cracking some nuts while his stockinged leg is almost like a sword pointing at the dog and beyond that to the womb of Isabella, as if he wants to violate their relationship. The other point to make about this painting, it's like a drawing worked up into a painting. Many did a lot of drawings for this composition. It's very lin linear, um, and this is, shows his debt to early Renaissance um, um, painting. When I say it's like a drawing, it's not like a drawing in the sense of classical idealization. It's more linear in keeping with the idea of the Gothic, which the pre-Raphaelites really admired. So it's like a drawing worked up into a paint and produced piecemeal, bit by bit. Now, drawing, really, was a manifesto for this tight, analytical, carefully worked pre-Raphaelite style. And um, around the same time, in order to get across this point, Millet started to produce parodies of the post-Raphaelite um, style in, pens in sort of pen and ink drawings. This one, for example, is called Imitations of Velazquez. And he's trying to parody the, sort of, you know, the, um, the Baroque post-Raphaelite manner through this sort of bravura penwork, which really sort of, you know, corresponds or parodies this sort of, you know, fluid brushwork, which the pre-Raphaelites dismissed as slosh rather than being accurate and precise. So the idea is this sloshy manner is lax, it's loose, it hasn't got the moral focus and integrity of pre-Raphaelite draftsmanship. Now, Millet's early paintings, like Isabella, as I mentioned, were highly controversial, and they succeeded in alienating Millet from his public. One critic actually described Isabella as if it had been squashed through a mangle. The you know, idea is a flat comp composition. There's no sense of perspective and depth in it. So it broke all the rules of academic painting. But what we see happening over the next few years is that Millet, who wanted to succeed with the public, gradually aims at a style or evolves a style which appeals more to his audience. And as he does so, he moves beyond this early Gothic phrase by exhibiting what we call pathetic subjects, subjects that appeal to the emotions and sympathies of his audience. And he did so as he came under the influence of a very important art critic. And this was John Ruskin, who was the foremost art critic in the Victorian period, who preached this idea of the principle of the pathetic, that painting should really engage with the audience on an emotional and moral level, particularly through the close study of nature. The image I've shown on the screen is the first painting Millet exhibited which won him favour with the public. It's called A Huguenot, and this was shown in 1852. And it's an imaginary subject from history. It was loosely based on Meyerbeer's opera, The Huguenot, um, but it's really, he's trying to show the plight of ordinary human beings caught in circumstances beyond their control. And so in the painting, you have a Catholic woman tying the, right, the white band around the arm of her Huguenot lover in a desperate plea to prevent him going off to be massacred or killed in the St. Bartholomew's Day um, massacre. So the focus is very much on their expressions and this sort of you new know, tender wrestling match between them. And the details, the ivy and the wall, are there to sort of you know, play up the emotion of the drama. Now, this painting was followed by another hit the following year, a painting called The Order of Release, 1746, another imaginary historical um, subject, this time set in Scotland in the 18th century. And this shows the scene where you have a Jacobite soldier who's been fighting against the English and has been imprisoned. His release has been secured by his wife, a poor Highland woman who's shown handing over the order of release 
to the prison um, guard. And the focus is on the reunion of this family group. And the emotion is very cleverly brought out by the fact that all the faces, the faces of the men and the child, are hidden. You only have contact with the face of the proud, upright, stoic Highlander woman. The idea being she's walked miles in bare feet to secure his release. And the wonderful touch of the dog, which unites the family group. Again, it's a beautifully observed picture. And you know, Millie, it was a great hit at the um, Royal Academy. Now, the model for the Highland woman in this painting was the art critic I've mentioned, John Ruskin's wife, Effie Ruskin. She posed for the, um, the, the woman. And this is interesting because around this time, she and Millet developed a very close relationship. Effie was very unhappy in her marriage to Ruskin. In fact, the marriage had never been consummated, which is another story I won't go into now. But um, around this time, she and Millet became very close, with the result that Effie managed to get an annulment for her marriage to Ruskin, and she married Millet in 1855. Now, this is an important turning point in Millet's career and reputation, because Effie, who you see in this photograph as Mrs. John Ruskin, when she married Millet, she helped introduce him to all sorts of new figures, several of whom had important contacts with Spain. Now, to begin with, Effie, when she was married to Ruskin, had been on very close terms with um, a young man called Claire Ford. Now, Claire Ford was the son of Richard Ford, who you see in the centre here, who was the foremost of, um, of literary Hispaniophiles, a great writer about Spain. He'd written a very important book called Handbook for Travellers to Spain in the mid-1840s. His son, Claire, who was on close terms with Effie, later became minister, and in 1887, he became the British ambassador to Spain. Effie also came from Perth in Scotland, where she was acquainted with another famous Victorian writer on Spain, and that's the gentleman you see in the bottom right, William Sterling who from 1865 became William, so Sir William Sterling Maxwell. And he was author of the Annals of the Artists of Spain, which had been published in 1848, the year the Brotherhood was established. And this book, it's probably fair to say, was the most ambitious text on Spanish art ever published in the 19th century. And it was based on his deep knowledge of the subject. And I mention this because it was through Effie's introduction, through Effie's introduction of Millet to Sterling, that Millet alighted on the subject for this Spanish um, subject called Escape of a Heretic, 1559. And this was intended as being the companion painting to the Huguenot, which I showed you a few minutes ago, a very grotesque painting which was seen to complement the tender emotion in the earlier work. Now, this painting represents a victim of the Spanish Inquisition who's being condemned to an auto de fe, being rescued by a man, probably her lover, who's disguised as a Franciscan um, friar, and he's shown trying to sort of you know, disguise her in a cloak. In the meantime, he's bound and gagged the priest who's come to hear her last um, confession. Now, it's highly likely that Sterling suggested the subject for this painting and that Sterling also wrote the long text or piece of writing which accompanied this painting when it was exhibited at the Academy in 1857. This is a whole long page of text which reads as a legal document um, which was actually titled in Spanish, Documentos Relativos a los Procesos por la Inquisición de Valladolid. I probably haven't, haven't said that very well, but that gives you an idea of this rather long, tedious legal document, which basically is the account of the gagged priest about how um, this woman um, 
under his supervision has, had escaped. Now, according to Effie, she mentioned that the painting had actually been inspired not only by Sterling's knowledge of Spain and Spanish history, but also by woodcuts and prints in his possession, many of which showed auto de fe's or victims of the Inquisition dressed in what she called the hideous San Benito costume, the yellow apron with devils parading around. It's also interesting that um, Sterling um, was one of the first collectors in Britain to have a deep appreciation of the art of Goya. He owned um, prints, etchings from Goya's suite Los Caprichos, and it's quite likely that he showed these to Millet, and these in turn, these are grotesque scenes of, you know, sort of you know, witches and sort of, um, um, devils, influenced the exaggerated and grotesque theatrical elements of Millet's design, such as the devils dancing around on the apron worn by um, the heretic. Now, when this painting was shown, it wasn't light. Ruskin thought, for example, it was detestable and um, theatrical, and um, people thought it was just grotesque, baroque, overdramatic. And they were also mystified by um, the odd, odd treatment of space, and some people pointed to what they felt was a very peculiar area on the right, that bright patch of colour, which you either can read as a sort of patch of green or yellow, or as a land, view to a landscape through the prison window. And this device, which plays on surface and depth, was probably suggested um, by work, the works of Velazquez, which Millet was looking at at the time. Um, for example, this painting, um, Velazquez's kitchen scene with Martha and Mary. Um, this painting is now in the National Gallery in London. It didn't, in fact, enter the National Gallery until the 1890s. But Millet will probably be familiar with it through illustrations for Sterling's important work, important publication, Velazquez and his works, which was published in the mid-1850s. And this book was important for British artists as a whole in that it claimed um, an empathy with the Spanish artist's blunt yet refined manner of execution. And it's really this sort of paradoxical, co paradoxical combination of elegance and bluntness and naturalism which led um, British artists later to claim Velazquez as an honorary member of the British school or sort of, you know, an artist whose work really um, prefigured what British artists were to do in the 19th century. Now, Millet's interest in the optical effects in Velazquez's paintings was also encouraged by the few works he would have seen in public collections, um, exhibitions of old master paintings, the Manchester Art Treasures for, exhibition, for example, but more importantly, through people he knew like Sterling, and also the artist who produced this work, a painter called John Philip. Now, Philip's an interesting figure. He was a Scottish painter who had known Millet since he was a little boy. He'd known him since um, childhood, and their careers were developed in parallel. But Philip was different in that he was fascinated by Spanish culture. He was immersed in it, and in fact, he made three visits to Spain in the early 1850s, the late 50s, and in the early 1860s. And these travels and his obsession with Spain earned him the nickname Philip of Spain. This is one of his Spanish subjects. In fact, it was exhibited at the same exhibition where Millet showed the heretic picture I just showed you. It's called The Prison Window, and it shows a, sort of, you know, um, a man in prison reaching out to cuddle and caress his child. Um, this is very typical of British artists' view of Spain, being non-threatening, very picturesque, with a focus on customs, dress and religion as created by the crucifix on the, on the wall. However, Philip was important for Millet and British art beyond the paintings of Spanish subjects he exhibited, because he, um, like earlier artists, such as um, David Wilkie, who travelled to Spain, he made a number of copies of Spanish artists, including Velazquez, which he showed 
to artists at home who had very little first-hand knowledge of Velazquez's works. Um, the most famous of the copies he produced was his partial copy of Las Maninas, which you can see hanging in his studio in this um, picture by an artist called John Ballantyne of John Philip in his studio. You can see the copy hanging on the distant wall with a curtain in front of it, obviously a prized you know, object in his um, um, studio. Now, um, Philip, beyond being, you know, um, Hang's deep knowledge of the Spanish um, school, was also a notable patron of contemporary art. And in fact, he was the first owner of this very progressive painting by the American artist Whistler, who worked in France before he came to London in 1859. This is called At the Piano, and it was a work much admired by Millet. Whistler, when he painted this, was very much under the spell of Velazquez. Like Millet, he never actually visited Spain, but while he was in Paris in the 1850s, he developed a taste for Spanish art, which he shared with the French romantics and realists. And you can see that in the very na narrow tonal range, the um, inscrutable, self-contained expressions, and the use of tone to convey space rather than um, conventional perspective um, or um, line. And it's through Millet's study of Whistler's paintings at this time that, Miss Whistler, um, that Millet's painting starts to change direction. As you can see in this painting, the Eve of St. Agnes, which he exhibited just a few years um, later. Again, this is based on Keats. It's Keats's poem, The Eve of St. Agnes, and it's basically the scene in which Prothero, the lover of Madeleine, observes, observes her undressing in front of her um, um, bed. But like Whistler's painting, it has a very narrow tonal range, it's very sort of loose and painterly, and it suggests space through tonal rather than through linear um, um, means. So it also shows you know, Millet's gradual engagement with Velazquez. Now these more painterly qualities in Millet's art begin to account, account for his relapse from pre raphaelitism back to post pre raphaelitism from where he started from. So it's around this time he starts to re-engage with the Baroque. And the works he produced in the 1870s are much larger in scale and more gestural in terms of treatment. And they show the influence of artists he would have despised and hated in his pre-Raphaelite years. Artists such as New Rembrandt, Titian, Franz Howells, artists who are painters above draftsmen and who promoted what the pre-Raphaelites called slosh over precision. This painting is one of Millet's most famous works. It's called The Boyhood of Raleigh, and it shows the youthful Sir Walter Raleigh listening to the tales told by a Genoese um, sailor of El Dorado, the land of El Dorado, of gold and opportunity, and how he's hypnotised um, by what the um, sailor is telling him. Yet the painting, with that rather sinister anchor, like an axe, mm. coming into the composition, also alludes to you know, his um, tragic destiny, because, of course, he was later executed. But this painting shows the influence very much of you know, um, Titian, in particular, with the bright um, um, colour. So, again, he's looking at art, these artists he would not have um, favoured during his pre raphaelite years. But, but the point I want to make, a, make, make here is that this is not really such a dramatic change in direction as might appear, because at all stages in his career, Millet's art was defiantly anti-classical. He was opposed to the idea of idealisation. He wanted his art to be natural and um, um, unreal. And this is something which distinguishes his art at the different stages of his career. Now, Millet's mature manner, as I sort of hinted earlier on, became increasingly identified with that of Velazquez, and this is probably because of the importance of portraiture for both artists. And as portraiture increasingly came to dominate Millet's unpractice, um, 
he began to sort of you know, loosen his, treat, his brushwork, and he felt that looseness of brushwork was important for trying to convey the energy and immediacy of his sitters. And in fact, Millet set down his ideas on this in his only published statement on art, which was a little essay called Thoughts on Our Art of Today, which he published in the 1880s, and where he argued for vitality and realism in art. <coughs> now, Millet's um, occupation with painterly aspects and formal aspects of Lasquez's art are most apparent in his paintings of children. Now, Millet's pic ch child pictures are often accused of being sentimental. But in fact, if you look at them closely, they're not at all sentimental. In fact, they have less in common with Murillo and the fancy picture as it developed in British art in the work of painters such as Reynolds and Gainsborough. But more, it has more in common, in fact, with Velazquez's um, court portraits. This painting is called The Minuet. It dates from the mid-1860s. And it shows his eldest daughter, Effie. I should mention, um, Millet and Effie had eight children altogether, which is why he had to produce a lot of paintings in his maturity to support this um, big family. The eldest child was called Effie, and she's shown here um, about, she's poised about to dance a minuet. And in the background, you have a woman playing the piano and this lovely sort of, you know, um, tapestry device. The pose of the um, girl about to begin her dance recalls, of course, the century placed Infanta Margarita in Velazquez's Las Meninas, which, of course, Millet knew through Philip's um, portrait. And at the same time, the um, contrast between the, you know, the girl very stiffly posed and the very loose, um, animated treatment of the accessories in the painting that also probably shows the influence of works such as um, Las Hilandelas, where you have the um, contrast between real and fictive figures in the tapestry. At the same time, the figure of the uh, weaver in the bottom right-hand corner, that's a figure which you see in that painting I showed you earlier on, The Boyhood of Raleigh. He's obviously looking at Velazquez for poses as well as for some um, more dynamic treatment of space. Now, the minuet is really a prelude to Millet's most direct engagement with Velazquez, which was a painting he called Souvenir of Velazquez. Now, this painting was his Royal Academy diploma work. I should mention that in Britain, when an artist was elected a full member of the Royal Academy, they had to submit a diploma work, and these works were hung in a gallery called the Diploma Gallery. Now, this painting was partly conceived as a tribute to John Philip, who died the previous year in 1867, and that was the year the Royal Academy purchased his copy of Las Maninas, the partial copy I showed you earlier on, and displayed it proudly in the diploma galleries. So Millet's painting would have been shown alongside that picture by um, Philip. The painting shows an English girl um, seated on a pile of books. She's wearing a dress of vague sort of Spanish character, holding an <coughs> orange branch in her um, hand. And her hair seems to fall very loosely around her um, soldiers, very much in the tradition of Velazquez's court portraits of women and children. And he was probably thinking of a picture he'd actually seen in the Louvre in 1859, Velazquez's Infanta Maria Margarita. Millet saw this on his trip to Paris in 1859 and probably remembered the, um, what the work. And this explains the title, Souvenir. Souvenir, of course, means memory. So it's a memory of this encounter with a Velazquez painting in Paris and also um, the Philip painting I mentioned as well. Now, this painting was probably the only, of, the only one of Velazquez's Infantas which Millet actually saw, the other paintings being in Vienna 
and Madrid, places he never visited. Now, the allusion to Velazquez in this can be seen in the dress, the pose, and the title. But I think beyond that, this painting is very much a declaration of this broad, energetic brushwork, which Millet was now promoting as essential to his understanding of what constituted naturalism in art. It's much more painterly than the previous painting, the minuet, which I showed you. And um, in fact, the paintwork, um, if you ever see this painting, is very aggressive. It's almost quite violent, the treatment of the, um, the brushwork. And so you could argue this painting is perhaps less a homage or a pastiche, but more it's an attempt to actually outdo Velazquez in terms of this bravura, energetic um, treatment. Um, you could actually argue this painting has more in common with late Titian than Velazquez's sober manner. But I think, all in all, it's really a manifesto for this free, suggestive manner he was now promoting. And also, it epitomises the eclectic spirit which Millet also promoted. He didn't want to be indebted to any one particular artist. He wanted to take on board various artists from the past um, in order to promote this idea of loose painterly brushwork. He didn't abide by the idea of slavish imitation. And this explains why Millet's feelings for Velazquez were in fact rather mixed. For example, he's actually recorded as giving advice to a contemporary artist, an artist called Frank Hull, who was also seduced by Velazquez at this time. And Hull was going off to Madrid to study the Velazquez paintings in the Prado. And Millet said to him, look well at Velazquez, study him, but don't copy him. He won't knock you down. So the idea is don't be overawed by this painter. He's just one artist you can learn by in order to develop your own distinctive manner. Now, at this point, I should just remind you that, of course, during the late 19th century, Velazquez enjoyed a huge renaissance in Europe. And this is because his art was seen to establish a precedent for the, impressionistic, the impressionist manner, which was very much in vogue. And because so little was known about Velazquez as an artist, as a man, then as now, it was very easy for artists to project their own ideas onto his um, style. And so Millet's understanding of Velazquez was that he was a painter's painter. And this also typifies Millet's response to other artists he admired at this time, such as Rembrandt, Titian, but also British artists such as Reynolds and Gainsborough. And so this painting, Suva of Velazquez, can also be seen as a homage to Reynolds, who was, of course, the first president of the Royal Academy. So I think Millet's saying through this that he's the great successor to um, Reynolds. And indeed, the year he died, Millet was himself elected president of the Royal Academy. Now, given his electric approach, Millet did not consider it necessary to visit Spain. He felt he could just absorb all these artists through museums in Britain, through his um, artist um, 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 friends. But at the same time, he was very keen to be regarded as an international figure. And indeed, he was. He was actually elected a member of the Madrid Academy, and he was on good terms with um, for, you know, prominent Spanish artists, such as um, Federica de Madrazo. This is um, Madrazo's um, portrait of Dona Emilia de Lano y Dotres in the um, Prado. He also knew Mariana Fortuny, who visited Millet at his Palace Gate studio many times. This is Fortuny's um, old man standing under the sun. So, you know, Millet being familiar with these artists' work, regarded Fortuny in particular as a sort of fellow naturalist. Millet also received many invitations to actually vis to visit Spain. The first of these came in 1878 from Maria de la Mercedes, who was the first wife of um, Alfonso XII. And Millet felt he wouldn't go because he felt were he to actually encounter Velazquez's paintings, it might contaminate his natural British manner of painting. He didn't want to be lured away from that. 
But the invitations kept coming, the last one being in 1890, when Queen Maria Cristina, Alfonso XII's second wife, gave an invitation to visit Spain. And many this time desperately wanted to go, but this time, by 1890, he was seriously ill with throat cancer, which killed him in 1896, so he was too ill to travel. But his daughter, Carrie, did visit um, the Prado. She went with um, Claire Ford, who was, of course, ambassador um, in Spain. And together, they looked at Velazquez's paintings and said, how much like Millet's art they are. <coughs> now, Millet's engagement with the performative elements of Velazquez's technique drew him back, as I've been arguing, to the old masters of the 17th and 18th centuries. But these, and I want to make the point that these artists he admired were what we can call humanistic artists, artists who were interested in mind, character, personality, sensibility. Um, where they manipulated paint in order to explore the tensions between protected and displayed identity. So he was an artist who was very much interested in character. At the same time, his interest in Velazquez placed him um, at the vanguard of artistic innovation in Britain. This was because the impressionistic manner of Velazquez was being appropriated by progressive or avant-garde artists in Britain for more formal, abstract ends, as can be seen in portraits of the period. So for here, on the left-hand side, you see Whistler's painting of the artist Louise Jopling. Um, Louise Jopling, I should mention, was a prominent female artist um, in Britain, female, prominent female British um, artist, who was also a suffragette. She was a campaigner for women's rights at the time. But Whistler, in his picture, is not really interested in her as an individual or as her being an artist. The image is almost like a fashion plate. She's shown from um, behind, showing off her modish attire. And as I said, it's like, it's like a fa fashion plate. It could be anyone. He's interested more in the colour harmonies, you know, the variegated blacks and the, you know, the, the, the contrast of the, you know, the whites and creams and the black-grey tones, which explains the other title of this painting. He actually titled it Harmony in flesh colour and black, giving it a musical title to try and reinforce the point that the painting should communicate through its you know, formal qualities rather than through um, the idea of representation. So, uh, so the idea that painting should be a vehicle for abstract arrangement. Now, Millet saw um, Whistler's portrait. He liked it very much, but a couple of years later, he did his own picture of Louise Jopling. He actually did this painting at his own instigation. Um, I should mention that Millet was a very close friend of Jopling. And in fact, his portrait, which you see on the right-hand side, this was given to the Jopling family as a christening present for um, Louise's um, son, who was, in fact, Millet's godson. So it was a present. This explains it's a very intimate picture between artist and um, sitter, and it really sort of shows the mutual respect between the two of them. So rather than turning away, she's actually facing the artist, the spectator, um, in her elegant black Parisian dress embroidered with little flowers. It has the same informal quality of Whistler's painting, but I'm sure you'll agree this has a greater sense of presence and individuality. He's showing her, not as being a sort of new feminine beauty, but as being a modern new woman. And as I mentioned, you know, um, she was a suffragette. As an artist, she was the breadwinner in the family. She earned the income through selling her um, pictures. So something of her strength and independence comes across in this bold, level expression, the way she engages you. So both these paintings engage with Velazquez, but whereas Whistler is responding to the austere abstraction and composing with tone like Velazquez, um, Millet's using the painterly, more interested in painterly technique and um, realism to display character and mind. We can see this 
in Millet's portraits of men. On the left-hand side, you have Millet's famous portrait of Gladstone. Gladstone, to remind, you, to remind you, was a Liberal MP and Prime Minister twice. Um, this was painted in 1879, the year before his second term in office. And like the Jopling portrait, this was painted at Millet's request. And this painting was highly regarded in its day, and many people saw it as being an essay in the manner of Velazquez, to which they were referring to the way in which Millet utilised this black, dark manner of Velazquez and northern artists such as Howells and Rembrandt to bring out the mind and character of this extraordinary individual. You can see how um, it's all composed of blacks and browns and greys, and the head is spotlit, almost as if it's a religious painting. And um, this allows him to accentuate the hands clasped and the steady, firm gaze of Gladstone staring into the distance. This shows you he's a man, man of vision. And the sense of his resolution is shown from his collar being upturned and the glint in his eyes. So it shows the formidable man of integrity and um, 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 courage. And you're a liberal like Millet, um, a liberal who Millet really admired. And this painting, as I mentioned, was discussed in comparison with Velazquez, and one critic said, you know, um, since Velazquez's time, you know, um, no one had been able to use paint to capture mind and the thoughts and personality of you know, great, in, great politicians of the day. I've put this up alongside a painting by the American artist, John Singer Sargent, who, like Whistler, worked in France before settling in London where he became a fashionable society portraitist. Sargent was unique among this group of painters I've been discussing, that he actually visited Spain and spent time in the Prado studying and copying on Velazquez's art. And he used his knowledge of Velazquez to develop his own distinct type of portraiture. This is one of his most famous pictures, the picture on the um, other side, of the East Seat painter and collector, um, W.G. Robertson, shown here as a rather effete young man in this splendid um, long overcoat wrapped tightly around his body to show his slender um, frame. And it's really an essay, like the Whistler painting, in these sort of flesh tones, blacks and um, um, greys, and enlivened by touches of... Um, lighter colour to show his elegant tapering um, hands and his pallid expression. Wonderful touch of green to show the jade on his walking stick and the little bit of ochre on the bow of his pet dog. And all this is to show how um, Robertson is a sort of, you know, refined um, east seat, a rather decadent, sort of dandyish um, um, figure. Great contrast with um, Gladstone, a manly um, heroic type of um, figure, um, with contrasting with this um, more refined um, aesthetic um, 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 type. So just showing you how um, Velazquez's manner was used in a whole variety of different ways by artists at the time. But what I want to get across here is that these artists' collective admiration for Velazquez offers us an alternative way of appreciating late 19th century art in Britain and encourages us to get away from the clear-cut divisions which art historians tend to set up between establishment figures such as Millet and um, more experimental artists such as Sargent and Whistler, whose works have been more comfortably accommodated within modernist narratives of art. And indeed, if you go back to the late 19th century and read contemporary writings on art, you will see that writers didn't make these distinctions. For example, in the mid-1890s, an important book was published on Velazquez, The Art of Velazquez, by R.A.M. Stevenson. And in this book, he spoke about the formal aspects of Velazquez's manner, facture, brush brushwork, field of vision, to show how Velazquez anticipated contemporary developments in art. And his arguments apply as much to the art as Millet as they do to artists such as Whistler 
or sergeant. Now, as a final note to this talk, I'd like to um, make the point that Millet's refusal to be associated with any particular fashion in art surprisingly made him probably the, one of the first British artists to appreciate the dark, introspective art of Goya. You can see here from one of the black um, paintings. Now, I've already mentioned earlier on how Millet had looked at Goya's etchings in the collection of um, um, William Sterling and how he's influenced his painting Escape of a Heretic. But in 1878, he had an opportunity to view Goya's black paintings when these went on display in Paris at the Universal Exposition of that year. Now, Millet, for that exhibition, had lent 10 of his paintings for which he was awarded a gold medal by the French government. Now, what's interesting, he obviously kept them, his memory of these dark, sort of his sinister paintings in mind. Because in the 1890s, when Millet, as I mentioned before, when he was suffering from cancer, um, he started to produce his own black paintings, a sequence of dark paintings, which are heavy, they have a dark tonality to them, and an intense mood of spirituality. And they're also, like this painting here, marked by an interest in violence and the supernatural. This is a painting Millet produced the year before his death of the Christian martyr Saint Stephen, just after he's been stoned to death. And he shows the young, lithe martyr lying out um, in this bleak landscape. In fact, the setting was based on a quarry in Canoul in Perth, just, just behind um, his wife's family um, home, a very bleak um, site with all this gorse around the um, sort of broken body of the saint. And in the distance, you can't see it because of the quality of the slide, but there are these rather sinister, Goya-esque figures emerging from the gloom mm -hmm. who are Stephen's disciples coming to bury his um, um, body. So though this painting, although it's not like Millet's interest in Velazquez, though it's not actually inspired by individual examples, I think it's just another example of the various ways in which the so-called dark and impressionistic art of Spain was adapted by Millet to promote his own brand of painterly realism, which in the late 19th century gave him the status of being the most prominent modern old master of the British school. Muchas gracias. Thank you.